I believe we've got something here that's going to put some meat on our bones. Amen. Amen. If you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. And while you're turning there, let me say again how thankful I am for your faithfulness to the house of God, uh, your faithfulness in giving to the work of God. And to that end, those of you in Facebook world, online giving is up and running. You can give uh, by credit card, you can give by ACH, or you can text your giving. It's all, all the instructions are right there on uh, our website, acts2ministries.church, or on our Facebook page. God bless you. There are several that have given that way, and I want you to know we truly appreciate it. We thank you. Amen. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 1. I would tell you what page that is, but my page doesn't have a page number on it. <laughs> the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. And it starts off by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Jesus Christ. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. You can be seated tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. The book of Ephesians is no more important than any other book of the Bible, but it's certainly no less important. But the book of Ephesians has a lot of gems and a lot of uh, nuggets of, of truth in it that is just astounding once you begin to study it and once you begin to dwell on it and, and partake of it. And, and you know, it's kind of like uh, your favorite cake or cheesecake or dessert. You eat some today, you're going to want some tonight. And you eat some tonight, you can, when you wake up in the morning, you might want that for breakfast instead of bacon and eggs. I'll yeah. take both. <laughs> Amen. But the book of Ephesians looks at salvation and spiritual conflict from a different point of view. In some ways, this particular epistle gives us God's viewpoint of these things. Yeah. Now, it was written by the hand of Paul, but Paul was inspired to write, and that's how it wound up in the Bible. Now, the book of Ephesians has been referred to as the Grand Canyon of Scripture, and here's why. You can visit the Grand Canyon and observe its breathtaking beauty. But if you ever have the privilege of going back the second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, and a tenth time, and a hundredth time, you're going to see something on those subsequent visits that you didn't see on the previous ones. That's right. And that's the way the book of Ephesians is. Every time you read or study the book of Ephesians, that reading and that study will shed some light on another nugget of truth, another gem of knowledge that previously had been unnoticed. And it's not, it doesn't work that way just with Ephesians. It works that way throughout the whole Scripture. Yeah. Uh, Many of us, if not all of us, are still doing the Bible in a Year program that Brother Simmons asked us to participate in two or three years ago. And that's not the first time I've read the Bible through. But every time I read the Bible through, I find something that I didn't notice the last time I read it. And that's, that's the way the Word is. That's the way the Word is. Now... The, the epistles in the, in the New Testament are, they're in the place they're in for a reason. They're not in front of Acts. They're behind Acts. They're not behind Revelation. They're in front of Revelation. Why? Because the four Gospels is the foundation. The four Gospels are the foundation uh, that this is built on. And it, the church came to fruition in the book of Acts. Now, the epistles, they don't tell us how to get saved. You find that in the book of Acts. 
What you find in the epistles is how to stay saved. A huge difference. For the folks that say, well, I, I believe in the Roman road to salvation. Well, you know what? The Roman road to salvation is just like the New Orleans road to salvation. It takes a trip through the altar. It takes a trip through Acts 2.38. It absolutely does. Uh, it, it, if you're going to be saved, we got to go through Acts to get there. Can't get there any other way. Acts 4 and 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So we can't go to the epistles to find the plan of salvation. It's not there. Not there. But the book of Joshua is very similar to the book of Ephesians in that Ephesians is to the New Testament what the book of Joshua is to the Old Testament. How is that? Well, it's like this. Joshua, the book of Joshua was all about the children of Israel entering into the promise. What is Ephesians about? It's about the saints of God entering into the promise. See, it's, it's not you come to the altar, you repent, you get baptized, you get filled with the Holy Ghost, and it's, that's all you got to do now. You, you, you just sit on the, on the church pew until you die or you're raptured. That, no, 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 no. A thousand times no. That's not the end all. That is the beginning of it all. Amen. Amen. Ephesians, just like the book of Joshua, is about us taking possession of what is rightly ours. And the, the, the study that I'm, I'm embarking us on tonight is, is going to take several weeks to complete. But it is rich. It is, it is very rich. It's deep. I want to know everything that belongs to me as a child of God. Does that sound selfish? I hope not. It's not meant in a selfish way. But the truth of the matter is you want everything that God has for you. We all should want everything that God has for us. That's not being a spoiled brat. That's not being uh, stingy. It's not being a jerk. It's, God, whatever you got for me, I want to walk in it. Because, in all honesty, that's the only way we can be pleasing, fully pleasing to God, is if we are inhabiting and taking possession of the promises that He has given us. When God gives us a promise, He expects us to take hold on it. Not to take it, wrap it up, and put it on a shelf somewhere and say, my, ain't that pretty. No, he wants us to take that promise, apply it to our lives, and walk, march toward the prophetic fulfillment of whatever that promise is. Amen. Joshua has Israel come into the place of no longer living as slaves or, or vagabonds. Joshua and Ephesians detail the experience of coming into the full possession of the promise. Mm -hmm. Now, there are things that we need to accomplish when studying the Bible, but in studying the book of Ephesians, we, we, we really need to understand some things. We need to understand the text. What is the text teaching us? What is Paul trying to say? Right. What are the implications of what Paul is telling us? Mm -hmm. And how do we apply this to our lives. Now, I'm going to ask a few questions uh, periodically in this study, and I would like some response from you guys. Okay. I really would. For instance, question number one, what is God's purpose for the church being in existence? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Glorify his name. Glorify his name. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else? Anybody else, brother? To uh, spread the good, good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and bring others in. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Be pleased in the hill. Be pleased in the hill. Mm -hmm. Indeed. These are good answers. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Not everybody at once. <laughs> And, and, and don't feel uh, intimidated or put on the spot. We're family. Yeah, right. We're family. And this is, this is, there are no gotcha questions in any of this. Yeah. Now, if I were teaching school, I'd have some gotcha questions. <laughs> but we ain't teaching school. <laughs> we're learning about the Word of God. So there are no gotchas in this. Yeah. Right. Amen. So uh, to bring glory to God, mm -hmm. to tell the others of the good news of Christ, and to be pleasing to him, right? These are excellent answers. And they're everyone correct. They're everyone correct. But now let me ask you this. Those were only three answers, but suppose everybody here had answered mm -hmm. and given uh, what they felt like is the reason for the church's existence. Would that mean we have this thing figured out? No. Yeah. Exactly. We would not have it figured out. What are some of the reasons for us having obtained the earnest of our inheritance? Now, uh, the apostle talks about uh, us having a token or an er uh, the, the, the earnest or, uh, of our inheritance. Uh, in other words... Whenever you, you go to buy a house, a car, not so much these days, but a house, certainly, uh, whenever you want, desire to buy a house that's been put on the market for sale, before your offer is considered valid, they want to see some earnest money. Right. What is that earnest money? It's a, it's a down payment. Now, it's not all of your down payment, but it is a down payment that goes toward the final down payment but they want to they want that seller wants to see if you are serious about buying that house if you want to offer a contract and put up no earnest money that seller's going to say see ya and in texas houses don't sit on the market too very long <laughs> they move pretty quickly uh, so the bible talks about the apostle paul talks about god giving us the earnest of our inheritance what is that what is that? It is just a small token of what's waiting for us over there. They, I don't know if you feel out, out there what I'm feeling right here, but the Holy Ghost is just washing over me. I mean in waves. Uh, it, 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 if I don't control it, I'm going to bust out speaking in tongues right now because the Holy Ghost is just washing over me. What is that? That is the token of our inheritance. It's just a down payment, if you will, of what's waiting for us in glory land. Amen. Amen. We're sitting together in heavenly places. So... Let me ask you this question. Why do you have the Holy Ghost? Does anybody have an answer for that one? Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Want his spirit living in us? Heard somebody else say to make it to heaven. Anybody else? God's plan. It's God's plan. That's a part of the salvation plan. Amen. I'm going to read Ephesians 1, verse 3 through 12 at this juncture. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I haven't been to heaven. And if you've been to heaven and you're still here, I would ask, why? <laughs> what could you possibly have been thinking? <laughs> yeah. 
while we haven't been there, we are in a heavenly place right now. Every time we gather to worship Him, we are in a heavenly place. Every time we sit down or kneel down for our own private devotions where there's nobody listening to how eloquently we pray, there's nobody there but you and God. You are in a heavenly place. And that is a token of our inheritance. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, and we've heard the term glory mentioned here a few times tonight, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to ex, uh, expound a little bit on each of these verses. I don't know how far we're going to get tonight. I've already been up here 15 minutes, 18 minutes for those of you who are keeping track. <laughs> Which used to be me. <laughs> and Brother Simmons told me the other day he was going to be the new time cop. <laughs> so, all right then. <laughs> In Christ Jesus. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at, Eph at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. We, we look at uh, a lot of things in life, and we, we look at uh, certain politicians, certain celebrities, and some of us may even have acquaintances and some of us, dare I say, have relatives that live double lives. But the truth of the matter is, as Christians, we live a double life. But in a good way. Not the sneaky Pete kind of way. See, we live here on earth. We have to work. We have to intermingle with the people of the world. We have to intermingle at school. We got to inter intermingle at the job. We got to intermingle in just doing any kind of business, going to the grocery store, paying bills, or whatever. We got to intermingle, intermingle with people that don't walk this way. Right. And I live, my address, my fiscal address is in Nederland. Y'all's are in Nederland. Some are in Bevel Oaks. Some are in Lumberton or Silsby and China. China. Almost says Sour Lake. <laughs> That's your physical address. But we also, a child of God also has a spiritual address. We have a physical life and we've got a spiritual life. Now, I don't particularly want to let go of this life right now. I mean, I'm, I kind of enjoy being alive. But the fact of the matter is, the spiritual life is even more real than the natural life. Come on. Because the natural life is going to go away one day. But that spiritual life is going to live forever somewhere. Come on. Amen. 
So every born again believer has a human address and has a divine address. We, we, we live in a certain place in this world, but we also live in Christ. Yes. Amen. And guess which one is really the most important? Is our life in Christ. Yeah. You see, we could have the, the best that, there, that this world has to offer. We could have the finest of accommodations. But if we don't live in Christ, what have we got? Right. It's yeah. temporary. It's yeah. going to go away. Yeah. Yeah. The flip side of that coin is we could live in the poorest of accommodations. But if we live in Christ, yeah. that's the most important. Yeah. Now, Having said that, I like being comfortable. I'm not advocating being poor for the sake of being poor. That is not what this is all about. But I am here to tell you, whenever our physical life means more to us than our spiritual life, we need a checkup. Amen. Amen. See, where, where we run into trouble is whenever we become too much of a citizen of right here and less of a citizen up there. Come on. My ultimate citizenship, now I'm proud of my American citizenship. I, I am. I am happy to be an American. I'm happy that I was born here. I don't look down on any country in the world. The poorest of countries, I have compassion. I feel for them. I'm thankful that I'm born right here in America. I love my country. But I tell you what I love more than my country is my heavenly home that I'm headed toward. Each of us are headed to an eternal destination. And while we should be patriotic, we must be patriotic. As, as, you, you can't be a Christian if you don't love your country. That's right. Wherever your country is, we've got to love our country. But what's got to be more important is our heavenly home. Because the truth of the matter is, according to verse 4, According as he has chosen us and him before the foundation of the world. What that tells us is that before the first thing was created, before the foundation was even laid, he chose you Amen. and me. Amen. Why? <laughs> My. The fact of the matter is... Uh, we can say we, we, we accepted Christ all we want to, but the truth of the matter is, without Christ accepting us, I can accept whatever I want to, but if Christ hadn't accepted me, I've got nothing. i got absolutely nothing. Amen. God adopted us. Now, God made us in the beginning. He, 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 he put us together. He fashioned us. He, he fashioned man from the, from the dust of the earth. He spoke everything into existence except for humanity. He built humanity with his hands. And the story is told about this young boy who, who built a, uh, he carved out a sailboat. And he spent hours carving that thing and building the sails for it. And finally he got it built, and he was done. He, he spent weeks on it. And after he got it built, he got it finished. He painted it and varnished it and, just, I mean, just made it look really nice. And he took it down to the local creek to see how it would do. And it happened to be a little windy that day. And he put that little sailboat in the water, and wouldn't you know it, there come a breeze. And he, he was proud, boy, filled the sails, and it, that thing was just moving on. And, then he realized with a shock of horror he couldn't get his boat back it was gone it was gone he was broken hearted he went home and he cried he told mom and daddy and they tried to console him the best they could a few weeks later he was walking down the street of downtown of the city he lived in and there was a little thrift shop there and they in that thrift shop they had different items uh, up there for sale and he saw something that caught his eye. It looked really familiar. And he looked really close, and it was his boat. So he was just ecstatic. He walked in there. He said, sir, that boat in that window, I made that boat. And a few weeks ago, I took it down to the creek to sail it, and it got away from me, and I lost it. I'd like to have my boat back. 
And the, the owner of the store said, well, son, you're welcome to have that boat, but you're going to have to pay the asking price for it. He said, but I built it. He said, son, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. It's my boat. You're going to have to buy it if you want it. Well, how much? So he told him how much, and the little fella, he just went to work. 50 cents here, 50 cents there, quarter here, dollar there. Finally, he got the 10 bucks or so that it was going to take to buy that boat, and he went back in there, and the boat was still there. And he walked in there to the, the proprietor, and he said, sir, here's your $10. Can I have my boat? He said, absolutely, son. You paid for it. The boy grabbed that boat. He didn't wait for a receipt. He just grabbed it, and he hugged it, and he caressed it. And as he was walking out the door, he said, you're mine, you're mine. You're twice mine. Once because I made you, and once because I bought you. That is just what Jesus did for us. We're his. We're twice his. Why? Once because he made us, and secondly, because he bought us on Calvary. He paid the price that we could not pay for our sin, wretched souls. Oh, my Lord. We belong to him. No wonder the apostle said, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. Every time I approach this pulpit, I say, God, I, 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 don't, I don't have the uh, oratory ability to preach and to feed this flock. I, I, I don't have it in me of my own to do this, God. I belong to you. I've been bought with a price, and I belong to you. So, Lord, if this people gets fed tonight through my preaching or my teaching, it'll be because you put the words there, God. Amen. 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 And most of the time, God lets me get up here and almost have a heart attack. <laughs> Not quite, but almost. Oh, Lord, I'm fast running out of time. The purpose of God's choices is, is twofold. It, it's absolutely twofold. You see, we, we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And every bit of what we're, I'm talking about here is found in the scripture that I just read. You see, the word holy and without blame uh, uh, that comes from a word called, uh, <laughs> in the Greek, hagios, I think. And that word simply means difference and separation. A thing which is hagios is different from ordinary things. Right. What makes a temple holy? What makes the house of God holy? Right. Simply because it is different from any other building around it. A priest is holy because he's different from ordinary men. A sacrificial animal is holy because it's different from the other animals. Right. See, back in the day when uh, sacrifices had to be made, that sacrifice couldn't be blemished in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have a scar. It couldn't have a cross eye. It couldn't have a weak eye. It couldn't have a runny nose. I mean, it, that animal had to be perfect. That's what made it holy because it was separated. It was different from the other animals. So God chooses Christians that we should be different from others. Now, I'm not talking about difference for difference sake. I'm talking about different because we want to please God. Uh, there are a lot of good people out there. Uh, there are a lot of good people. I know a lot of excellent people who don't walk this way. I'm not taken away from whatever goodness they have. There are some good people. But we have to walk circumspectly before the Lord. The difference does not take a man out of the world, but it helps that man or woman to be different within that world. It should be possible to identify a Christian no matter where you are. Walking down the street, you should be easily identifiable as one of his. And... Let me rephrase that. We should be easily identifiable 
as one of his. Whether we're in school, at the mall, on the job, visiting in the hospital, anywhere. The difference is simply this. The Christian lives, works, and behaves not as any human compels him to do, but as the law of Christ compels him to do. How are we different from those around us? Well, for one thing, we're blameless. Not that we don't have mistakes. You can examine me and find a bunch of flaws. I mean a bunch of flaws, but the truth is we can examine you and find some too because we all have them. What makes us blameless is not that we're without fault. It's not that we're perfect within ourselves. It's that we put on Christ. That is what makes us blameless. Why? Because Christ took the blame in our stead. He took the punishment for our sins in our place. And God looks at us and says, yep, just right. Yeah. Just right. Yeah. Come on. Becoming blameless is not... It, it, it's not something that, that should give us the big head. Because after all, we're human and we're going to, <laughs> we're going to make a mistake. Come on. Somewhere along the way, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to make several of them. Uh, it's, it's not how perfect we are is not the point. No. What matters is, am I more blameless today than I was a year ago? Right. In other words, am I closer to God today than right. I was a year yeah. ago? And, and I'll bring it even, even closer to home. Am I closer to God today than I was yesterday? Yes, amen. That's the measuring stick. Becoming blameless is taking every aspect of our life and making them such that they can be offered to God. There can be no contentment with second best. See, we can't, we can't take uh, uh, the crutch that says, I have faults, but, hey, if you knew my ancestry, you'd understand. I, I looked at, a, I looked at uh, a book the other day, a part of a book the other day that told about my granddaddy you know, my granddaddy was an old man when my daddy was born and my daddy was an old man when I was born so we're talking a long time ago but I got some real scalawags back there I mean some real sca questionable people at best <laughs> but you know what, sister? You're absolutely right. We all do. We all got somebody back there that's questionable. <laughs> but we can't use that as a crutch. We can't. In fact, the mistakes that we make, we cannot use that as a crutch. We must. When we make our mistakes, when we trip and we fall, we stumble and we get, fall in the mud hole and we get dirty, and we, what we've got to do is to get up from there, find an altar, let the blood of Jesus wash us all over again, and then stand up and live for God. Amen. That's what we have to do. Because the truth of the matter is, it really doesn't matter what I think of you or what you think of me. What matters is what does God think about us? What does God think about us? In verse 5, the apostle talks about having, been, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now... There was a, a gentleman back when named John Calvin. No relation to me. <laughs> but he taught that our eternal fate is already predetermined. What he taught was that 
nothing we can do can change where we're going when we die. No, no. We're either going to heaven or we're going to hell, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. That's right. Right. That is so antithetical to the Word of God. What this word here, predestinated, means is the boundaries have been marked out beforehand. In other words, God was saying, I have predetermined that I'm going to adopt sons and daughters into my kingdom. And it's whosoever will can be a part of that. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, how your credit rates, if you even have any credit, how much money you got, how much money you don't have. None of that matters. How, what color you are, what your ethnicity is, what you believe, uh, or, or yeah, what you believe matters. But what, what, you, what, you, what you think about who should have won the presidency, who should be in charge, none of that matters. God has determined that he is going to have a church, and it's up to us if we want to be a part of it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if any of us are predestined to, deter, uh, to damnation then the scripture that says it is not my will that any should perish but that all should come to repentance that scripture would be a lie mm -hmm. so we're not predestined as individuals the church is predestined to be victorious yeah. right. whether or not I am victorious whether or not you are victorious depends on whether or not we are a part of the blood bought church right. Right. amen <coughs> amen I'm gonna I am not gonna be able to get through this completely so I'm gonna get to about the halfway mark and then we'll we'll uh, pick up on it next week in verse 7 he talks about redemption well, let's read verse 7 again. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The, 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 the word redemption, its, it's very definition means we have to be, if, if something is redeemed, it has to be redeemed from something. We have been redeemed. The apostle goes on to explain through his blood, we have been redeemed from sins. We have forgiveness of sins, and it's according to the riches of his grace. You see, I can forgive you for this, that, or the other, but that and five bucks will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. It really don't mean a whole lot. But when God forgives us, that can get us into heaven. That's the kind of forgiveness we need. Yeah. If I offend you, yeah. I, I certainly want to repent and apologize and ask you to forgive me. And I certainly hope you would forgive me. But the one that absolutely I got to have forgiveness from is from him. Amen. 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 Uh, verse 9. Have he made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. In the New Testament, a mystery is something that we can all agree, even not in the New Testament. It's, it's a secret that has been kept. It's a mystery. But in the New Testament, it means something that has been a secret, but has now been revealed, such as the oneness of the Godhead. Uh, it, it, it's, to a lot of people today, it's a mystery. It's not a mystery to us because it has been revealed that there is only one and that Jesus was not the second person of the Trinity. He was God himself wrapped up in human flesh. Because God is a spirit, God could not bleed. God could not die. God could not be tempted. But if he was going to be the sacrificial lamb, he had to make a way where he, would, he could bleed, he could hunger, he could be tempted. And where he could die. Yep. So he took on the, uh, the, 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 the form of Jesus Christ. He took on human flesh. Yes. So that he yes. could face all these yes. things. Yes. And then he could say. I know what it's like. That's yep. right. yep. Because until that point. God couldn't say I know what it's like. Amen. Amen. But at that point. God could say I know what it's like. Uh -huh. Not the second person in the Godhead. But God himself. Yep. Yep. 
Amen. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And what this verse is telling us about is it's just a little bit of a foretaste of what we're going to learn about God's intention. Right. <laughs> and I can tell you this, when God intends, God's will is going to be accomplished. Amen. God intends yes. to gather all things into one in Him. Yes. In Him. I want to be in yes, him. Amen. 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 Verse 11, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. And again, predestinated is not individual predestination. It's corporate predestination. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, that has already been predetermined from before the foundation of the world. What is going to make the difference for me is if I choose to submit myself to the will and the plan of God. And the same for each of you. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? There is no way I'm going to be able to get to the end of this. I don't want to close without giving a space for prayer. If anybody wants to come to the altar, this has not been a hellfire and brimstone message, but this has been about learning about God's love for us and how we can be a part of Him. Because He certainly wants to be a part of us. He wants to... He, he cares about what we care about. He cares about our hurts. He cares about our needs. He cares about our dilemmas. He cares about the troubles and the trials we face. Yes, He does. Yes, He does. So tonight these altars are open. I, I want to make this available. If anyone feels the need and has a desire to pray. I give him after all he has given.
Jesus' name.